All right, <clears throat> let's begin. Um, so a week from today, you're going to have homework six to do, and we're also going to have the exam. And uh, I thought about it a little bit more. And in addition to the equation packet that I'm going to provide, uh, you can bring one page, just the front side of any notes that you'd like to include. And so I don't expect that you'll need to write any formulas, since I'm already going to be providing you with any formulas you'd need. But those could be things like uh, uh, an outline of solution strategy or uh, encouraging note from your grandma or something. Just <laughs> whatever you think would uh, help you to do better on that exam, you can include it on uh, that one page, front side only, of the, uh, of the notes. Any questions about the announcements? All right. Um, still working through the, uh, the homework assignments that were submitted. Uh, you know, when there are so many different solution strategies, it's a challenge for the grader to go through those. And I'm going to have to take a look at some of them. Um, but just to reemphasize the expectations, whenever you submit a homework assignment, it needs to be just exclusively what you did, your own work. And so it can't be based on any sort of reference that you find online, because I know that PDF solutions are available uh, for the textbook author solution. It shouldn't be uh, some previous student who took the course in a past semester and, and their efforts. It should just be what you calculated and what you figured out that you submit. All right, so today we're going to be talking about pumps and how it fits into the energy equation and uh, closed conduit flow. The uh, simplest kind of pump <coughs> is one that um, adds energy in the form of lifting water. And uh, a positive displacement pump with each rotation is going to deliver a certain volume of water. And so you can kind of get a sense for if you had a screw-shaped pump like this in a trough, and the trough is submerged <laughs> down, down into a uh, stream. And uh, up at the top here is a motor that's causing that screw to rotate. And so what it does is, by trapping the water against the edges of the trough, it lifts it gradually upward. And then there would be an opening at the top where it, it empties out. Um, so I mean, this is in some way similar to if you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland, you know, the Swiss Family Robinson, how they have the buckets that are on a rope. And they're just. Uh, taking the water up to the treehouse or whatever, that also be an example of a positive displacement pump. Since it's open to the atmosphere, the water isn't pressurized at all. And so it's only suitable, this type of pump, for a situation where you're starting with an open channel and you're discharging it to an open channel. Um, and it's adding, if you think about the energy equation in the three terms of the energy equation, Remember that the energy can be in the form of pressure head, elevation, and velocity head. And so those are the three forms that energy can be in as we're talking about the movement of water from place to place. This is adding energy in the form of increasing the z, increasing the elevation of the water above some datum. Here are some diagrams that illustrate different types of positive displacement pumps each operating on the similar principle that a certain rotation is going to deliver a fixed volume of water. And so in the case of the rope pump, you can see that what's happening is that there's a plug that's forming a seal inside of a uh, pipe. And then as it reaches the outlet of the pump, then that water is forced to go out the side. Well, it's not forced to go out the side. It could go out the top. but it's a, a lower energy pathway for the water to go out the side than to continue going upward out the top. Uh, peristaltic pumps are pretty commonplace if you ever find yourself in an environmental or a water quality lab. Uh, these peristaltic pumps are popular because what's going, uh, what's going on here is there is a, a piece of tubing, plastic tubing, that a roller is pressing against at a certain speed. And as that pinches the tubing, then it delivers a certain volume of water to go out. And they're able to deliver a very low flow rate of water in a very precise and metered fashion so that you know uh, exactly how much water is being delivered. And so uh, we're talking, it can deliver as little as milliliters per hour. 
in a very controlled fashion. And so sometimes when you're trying to have a chemical reaction or deliver a reagent uh, at a very controlled and slow speed, then peristaltic pumps work good for that. So the rest of these are, are kind of exotic and probably would be uncommon for you to ever encounter a pump of these types. Sometimes they're used in, uh, in engines for fuel delivery. Uh, but what's far more common in municipal applications are radial flow pumps, a uh, cent centrifugal pump, uh, rather than increasing the uh, elevation of water, it's adding, adding energy to the system by increasing the pressure. Um, and so the water is flowing into the pump through this suction side, and it immediately encounters a spinning disc. And you can see this red spinning disc has veins that are angled and the uh, rotation of those veins is uh, accelerating the water and we know that an acceleration is going to cause an increase in pressure and the thing that's sometimes difficult for people to think about is that although the water is being accelerated its velocity on the suction side versus the pressure side isn't necessarily changing you know, if you have a one inch diameter inlet and a one inch diameter outlet, then of course we know from the continuity relationship that the velocity in and the velocity out have to be equal. And so it's accelerating the flow, um, but it's not increasing the pressure, excuse me, it's not increasing the velocity um, in terms of position. But it is changing the velocity of flow, um, you know, if the pump isn't on, so the before versus the after, it certainly changes the velocity if you have a pump in a system that's turned on then suddenly the velocity is going to be moving through that system quite a bit more quickly. Um, it's common for it to change the direction of the flow and sometimes uh, depending on the application that can be a little bit inconvenient. Pumps like this are usually mounted at the surface because of that direction change um, and the pump is usually coupled with an electric motor although in some cases, there would be like internal combustion motors that are paired with pumps like this. And here in Huntington, there's a, a drinking water treatment plant just up the road, and they have a couple of backup pumps that are gasoline driven. Although, in most cases, under normal circumstances, they're pumping the water up out of the Ohio River with uh, electric motors. Um, so that's a radial flow pump. Um, an axial flow pump is adding energy in the same way, where there's an impeller that's accelerating the fluid and therefore adding pressure. It's just in the case of the axial flow pump, what it allows you to have is a really long drive shaft that could be mounted up at the surface. And so you could submerge the impeller of an axial flow pump down in an aquifer. So it could be, in fact, hundreds of feet underground that the, uh, that the pump itself is operating. But then the motor could be up at the surface where there's electricity available, cooling, for the heat that's going to be generated by the motor. Um, but the, the main point is that it's, this isn't changing the direction of the flow. The flow uh, continues in the same direction, both on the suction side and on the discharge side. Although, you know, there could be a bend in the pipe uh, subsequent to the pump itself. So those are axial flow pumps. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind <coughs> is that uh, there is the possibility that negative um, gauge pressure can occur in a pump. And so uh, consider this case where we have a centrifugal pump at the surface. And here's, you can tell, a free surface of water. And the indicators of that is the triangle at the surface. These little uh, horizontal lines are meant to evoke the idea of ripples on the surface of the water. So here's a free surface of water. And we know that right at the interface of the air and the water, so here at the boundary, the pressure is zero. And what that means is that inside the pipe, the pressure will be roughly zero as well. Now here, you can see they've got a strainer to try and keep debris from getting up into that pump. It could cause damage if twigs or fish get into the, uh, into the pump. So there's the strainer there. And as the water is flowing, it's losing energy due to pipe friction. Even on the suction side, there's a reduction in pressure due to pipe friction. And so imagine if this suction side length is really long, 
what's happening is, is that you're starting at zero pressure here, uh, zero gauge. Now, of course, it's not zero absolute. It's 101.325 kilopascals right at this elevation. But then as the flow continues, the pressure is gradually decreasing and decreasing because of pipe friction. And there's this critical point that we have to be concerned with where if the pressure of the water drops below the vapor pressure of the liquid, then cavitation can occur. And you remember that uh, we saw some pictures of a dam in Russia that had experienced some problematic cavitation. You know, last semester in fluid mechanics, we talked about how cavitation, those tiny little air bubbles, when they form uh, and then they collapse, can send a shock wave through the system and can cause pitting and erosion of the impeller. So we'll talk in more detail about cavitation today, but this is a good cross-sectional view that explains why cavitation can occur. Now, so the same thing here with this uh, other axial flow pump. As the water is entering the pipe, of course, we're below the water surface, and so the pressure is positive. But when you get above the water surface, now the pressure is negative, and it continues to be increasingly negative until it reaches the... Uh, <coughs> excuse me, until it reaches the pressure side. And so here, the, um, the impeller blades are below the water surface, and there won't be cavitation. But if the impeller blades are above the surface, then there is the potential for cavitation to occur, because there would be negative pressure until you get to the suction side, uh, the pressure side. And so here, in, in this pump, the... Uh, the riskiest point where we're going to have the most negative pressure is right just before the water flows into the pump. But then once we get past the pump, the pressure is high. And then there isn't any longer a risk of cavitation. One of the other interesting things about uh, pumps like this is that sometimes when you're first starting it up, you have to put water inside of the pump. Uh, some pumps are designed so that they're airtight and that they can start to suck the water from a dry suction side. But in other cases, you have to prime the pump. And so you'd put a check valve near the strainer. You'd pour, maybe with a hose, uh, water into the suction side line and into the pump itself, and then turn it on. And that can be a little bit inconvenient when you're starting it for the first time. After that, the foot valve is on, right? That's right. Yep. Um, but sometimes this, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily have a check valve, and so if you turned it off, then the water would drain back down. And so I worked with a pump when I was um, in graduate school, earning my PhD, that didn't, we didn't have a check valve at the end of the line, but it would generate enough suction that it could go from dry to filling it, but it would have to spin for about 20 or 30 seconds before it finally developed enough negative pressure in the suction side to start lifting the water. And that was always, uh, you know, a little bit of a nail biter because the pump's getting hotter and hotter when the water isn't flowing through it to cool it. So, you know, you're, you're wondering, uh, is it going to burn up this time before the water gets in there? It never did. So, um, so here's the uh, ideal pump equation, both in SI units and BG units. And so uh, the pump equation for ideal, where we're not yet accounting for any losses due to inefficiencies, is the flow rate in terms of cubic meters per second, the unit weight of the liquid in terms of newtons per cubic meter, and then pump head in meters. And what comes out of that is watts. So the power is expressed in terms of watts. Now, over here in the uh, traditional units, the flow rate would be cubic feet per second, <coughs> The unit weight would be pounds per cubic foot. Pump head is feet. And then the 550 conversion, you may remember there are 550 foot-pounds uh, per um, horsepower. And so the units that are going to come out of this is uh, horsepower. Um, there are inefficiencies for both the motor and the pump. And so the overall efficiency is the product of the two. Uh, so you may have a motor that's 70% efficient and a pump that's 70% efficient. And then in that case, you'd have to multiply 0.7 by 0.7, and your overall efficiency would be 0.49.
And so then the, the real pump equation that's taking into account the inefficiencies of the motor and the pump uh, is that you're going to divide the ideal power required by the efficiency. And then that'll tell you how much power has to go into the uh, electric motor in order to deliver a certain amount of power to the fluid. So it's always going to be more in the case of a pump. You have to put more electricity into a pump in terms of watts than the amount of watts that are making their way into the water uh, because the, uh, the motor is going to be heating up and so there are losses of energy in that sense. Uh, the pump is going to be vibrating and uh, vibrations are energy losses that aren't added to the fluid. Um, now, uh, we'll look at some tables that illustrate pump efficiency and uh, what you'll notice is that pumps, you know, one particular pump doesn't just have a single efficiency. It, efficiency is going to vary depending on what kind of fluid it's pumping. Uh, the efficiency of the pump is going to vary depending on uh, the diameter of pipe that it's connected to, the speed that it operates at, and the flow rate. So there's a lot of factors, and selecting the right pump for a given situation is uh, a highly specialized uh, task. There are engineers who do nothing but pump selection to try and identify the, uh, the ideal pump that's going to have the best efficiency for the range of conditions that the uh, pump is going to be used in. And you know, over the course of some pumps are in place for more than 100 years. You know, that Huntington water treatment plant that I was telling you about, they have pumps that are more than 100 years old. And so if you think if you can squeeze just an extra 2 or 3 percent efficiency over a pump that's going to be in continuous use for 100 plus years, then you can really save a lot of electricity cost by uh, having the right pump in place. Okay, um, so pumps are used uh, in such a way that as the flow rate of a pump increases, the amount of head it is able to add to the system goes down. And so we need to talk about this curve. This shape is a characteristic shape um, sometimes it's not quite that steep. You know, sometimes it would be flatter before it starts tapering downward. This equation is just an example of what a pump performance curve equation can look like. This isn't like the generalized always valid. Um, but for any type of pump performance curve, what we start off with is how much head, how much head could the pump add to the system uh, at an extremely low flow rate? And this is called the shutoff head because it's how much energy the pump would be able to add at essentially a zero flow rate. Or the other way to think about it is if you connected a pump to a system that had a lot of losses after the pump, or maybe you're trying to lift the water very high, then there's going to be a certain elevation that the pump can't lift the water to. You know, if you just had an ordinary pump and you're trying to add enough pressure to uh, take water to the top of the Eiffel Tower for a fountain up there. Um, there are pumps that can't lift all that way up, and so the height of the uh, pump's ability to lift water is the shutoff head, and so that has units of meters over here on the vertical axis. But if you're not needing to add quite that much energy, then the pump can operate at a higher flow rate. And so what this curve is saying is, let's say that you want to deliver 10 liters per second. Well, if you want to deliver 10 liters per second, you're not going to be able to add as much pump head. And remember that the pumps add energy in the form of pressure. So when we say the head that's being added by the pump, what we're really uh, doing is we're measuring that pressure, but in terms of meters. And so if we, if we say that the uh, pump head in this case, the curve says 24.4. That's the intercept at a zero flow rate. So if the cutoff head is 24.4 meters, then the amount of pressure that it's adding, we'd say 24.4 meters times gamma is the pressure that's being delivered. And so, of course, gamma varies based on temperature, 9810 newtons per meter cubed. So let's just see how much pressure could this particular, the maximum amount of pressure this pump could add to the system. 
24.4 times 9810. So this pump could add 239 kilopascals. 239 kPa. But it can only add that much pressure to the system at a very low flow rate, at essentially zero flow rate. If you need to get a certain amount of water to your destination at a faster speed, then it's not going to be able to deliver that much pressure. And so let's say that you're moving water from one tank to another tank. And you have this pump available. Well, you may have to use a larger pipe after that pump because then there would be less friction losses and then the pump would be able to deliver the uh, flow rate that you need. So this is just one half of an equation that we're going to be looking at. The pump performance curve basically describes the ability of the pump to add pressure at a variety of different flow rates. And the, uh, the trend is, is that the flow rate is low for a high pressure that it can add. So you can either have it operating at a fast rate and only delivering a little bit of pressure or you can have it operating at a low flow rate and delivering more pressure. The typical relationship is that the head delivery is varying as a function of flow rate squared. So that Q squared is pretty common, but these prefixes like the cutoff point and then this coefficient in front of the Q squared, that'll vary depending on the pump. And this is information you get from the manufacturer. They have books full of equations and graphs that shows you the pump performance. So that's one half, is what the pump is able to do. The other half of the consideration is what does your system look like? And so here's that case of you're lifting water from some lower reservoir to an upper reservoir. And so the pump is doing the work of increasing the Z to get the water from the origin to the destination. So what we could do is we could write a system curve. Now the last curve that we saw, that was called the pump curve. This system curve is basically an expression where you're rearranging the energy equation and you're trying to find out for a certain flow rate how much pump head is required to lift the water. And so we've rearranged the energy equation here in terms of H sub P. Um, so just to uh, make the jump a little bit more obvious, let me write the entire energy equation on the whiteboard and then we'll see how we ended up with this version of the energy equation and why we're calling it the system curve. All right, so when there is a pump, the energy equation is P1 divided by gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared divided by 2G plus H sub P is equal to P2 divided by gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared divided by 2G plus all of the losses. And the losses that we have are the friction losses H sub F and the local losses H naught. And collectively sometimes we call those two terms H sub L. Okay, so this is the full energy equation. So what we're saying is that if we have water going from one tank to another, so location one is the surface of the lower reservoir, and location two is the surface of the upper reservoir, then we know that inside of that tank, the velocity, the movement of the water is essentially zero. So we can just cross out the uh, velocity head terms because both V1 and V2 are zero. And now what we want to do is ha leave the uh, H sub P on the left side. And this is how much pump head is required in order to lift the water delta Z. And so the delta Z that we're talking about, Z2 minus Z1, that is the delta Z. So we move the delta, the um, Z to the other side. Now you'll notice that there's no pressure terms in this system curve, and that's because location one is at the water surface where there's just an interface between the atmospheric pressure air and the water. And so we're also canceling out the P1 and the P2 terms. So really all that's left is it's the delta Z and then the losses. 
And so the losses are going to be the H sub F and the H naught. Now, H sub F, we can express that in terms of the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. And so H sub F, of course, is F L V squared divided by D to G. But instead of having it in terms of the velocity squared, what we'll instead have is it in terms of the Q squared. And so if we want to have it in terms of flow rate, Q squared, then we have to put A squared in the denominator as well. And then the local losses, H naught, that is the K values times the velocity head, V squared divided by 2G. And if that's going to be in terms of flow rate rather than velocity, then it's going to be Q squared divided by 2G a squared. And then the final step is simply just to uh, pull out the common Q squared. And uh, so the system curve is really just the energy equation. And you can arrange it by looking at the scenario that's described. Now here's our solution strategy. What we have is we want to find the operating point. We want to know when you pair a pump with a given system, what flow rate will occur. Remember, this was the graphical expression of our pump. We can come up with a graphical expression of our system. And so the system is going to have an intercept. This vertical intercept is the delta Z. And then the amount of head required increases exponentially as the flow rate goes up. Because there's going to be more and more losses. As you increase the flow rate, there's a lot more friction losses and local losses. And so that's why this is getting steeper and steeper and is increasing exponentially. What we do is we put the two together. We put together a system curve and a pump curve. And where they intersect is our operating point. So this is the graphical approach to finding the solution. And the question is, you know, what's the flow rate when you put a certain pump into a certain uh, system? And then if the uh, flow rate that results is adequate for what you need, you know, if it's going to be lifting the water and pumping it quickly enough, then you're good. Um, if, it, if the operating point, if the flow rate's too high, of course, we could always put a valve in between here and partially close that valve. And that's going to increase the friction losses so that then we have it operating at the right flow rate that we want. But if the operating point was too low, then what that means is you have to find a different pump. All right. Now, one of the tricky things in finding the operating point is that we're saying we're going to use the uh, Darcy-Wiesbach friction method for our pipe losses. But the F depends on the flow rate and the velocity. Remember that the F value, we determine that from the Jane equation or from the Kohlberg equation. And so we're trying to say how much head loss there is as the water flows through the system, but we don't yet know the F value because we don't know the Reynolds number. So this is one of those tricky situations where uh, we can't quite solve directly. And so you can use the fully turbulent flow assumption to begin with to estimate F. And then once you've determined the flow rate operating point, you'd find out what's the Reynolds number and double check to see if the fully turbulent flow assumption was close enough. You know, if it was less than 2% difference between your initial F value and then the actual F value, then you don't necessarily have to iterate a second time to find the adjusted flow rate. All right, so let's practice this. What we want to find out is if we pair this pump with the system characteristics that are summarized here in the bulleted list. You know, we have a system where the pipe length from reservoir to reservoir is, is 120 meters. And we're going to be using a, a pipe diameter of 250 millimeters. And we know the roughness of the pipe. And it's lifting the water 9.1 vertical meters between reservoirs. And then there's some local losses in there with a K of 2.4. So what your solution strategy should be is, first of all, Plug these values into the system curve, and you'll come up with some system curve. And then you set the system curve equal to the pump curve. So it's going to be H sub P 
equals to h sub p, and the only unknown will be q. All of these other variables are going to be filled in with the information that you've got in the bulleted list or, or things you're calculating, like cross-sectional area you can calculate, the f value you'll determine from the fully turbulent flow assumption within the Jane equation. So you set the two equal and solve for q. All right, so I'm going to pause for a moment. I'll be circulating around with the solution if you want to double check, and then we'll uh, take a look on the screen to make sure we're on the same track. Okay, so as you're going through your calculations, I'll mention one thing that is easy to overlook. So if you've got your area calculated, be sure that you uh, square the area down to the denominator. That's one that uh, can be easily overlooked. And when you use the fully turbulent flow assumption, you should get the F value as 0 0.0196 when you're doing the fully turbulent flow assumption. So you're going to put all these other variables in and uh, Solve for the Q. So when you've got the flow rate, let me know, and uh, I'll tell you if you're on the right track there. It's so easy to punch something wrong in your calculator. I really think it's a good habit to try and do as much of the work on paper as possible and kind of keep tabs on on everything while you uh, simplify it down into a smaller equation. So for instance, what I mean by that is we can see the relative effect of the pipe friction versus the local losses. You know, as we're developing this prefix that goes in front of the Q squared, it looks like most of that, uh, most of the resistance is due to pipe friction. You know, 198.98 due to pipe friction versus 50.76 for the uh, local losses. Um, so this is our system curve, 9.1, because we're lifting it 9.1 meters. So at the very least, our pump has to um, provide 9.1 meters of head just to get, overcome the vertical difference. But then we also need it to generate even more head depending on what flow rate we want to achieve. And so as the flow rate goes up, then you're going to have to deliver successively more and more head. So just at a quick glance, how much uh, pump head would we have to add if we wanted to achieve one cubic meter per second? Well, then it would be 9.1 plus 249. So it would be like about 260 meters of head to achieve uh, one cubic meter per second between these two reservoirs. And if that's ridiculous, that's a lot of pump head, then that tells you Maybe we need to find some way to reduce the amount of losses. You know, like if you were designing this system and you said, man, I don't know if we're going to be able to find a pump that will deliver enough head to overcome all this resistance. Well, then the answer is make it so there's less resistance. Use a bigger diameter pipe. And if we had used a larger diameter pipe, then this 198 would be much, much lower. Because, uh, you know, think about what's down here in the denominator. The cross-sectional area would be uh, larger, as would the diameter. And so that means that that prefix wouldn't be as huge. All right, so we develop the system curve. And we set it equal to the pump curve. So system curve equals pump curve. Okay, so on the left here is this 9.1 plus 249.74 Q squared. And then the pump curve is on the right. And we simplify, so move the 7.65 over here, move the 9.1 over there, and then you just solve for Q. So it should be 0.244 cubic meters per second when we match this pump and this system together. That's the flow rate that it can achieve. And so if we only needed to pump 0.1 between these two reservoirs, then this would work because we could just put a valve in between and close that valve part down and uh, reduce the flow rate. But if we needed to achieve more than this, then our two options is a bigger pump or change the pipe network so that there's less resistance. Does that make sense? 
Well, we have one last thing to do. Anytime you use the fully turbulent flow assumption, you have to check to make sure it's valid. So we now have a flow rate, and that's going to allow us to determine the velocity. You know, Q divided by area gives you the velocity. And then the Reynolds number. Um, <clears throat> on the PDF that I'm going to be bringing up on the screen, all I did was I went to the Moody diagram. That's kind of a lazy way to check the fully turbulent flow assumption. Let me write on the whiteboard me using the, uh, the Jane equation to double check. It's a lot more accurate. So checking the fully turbulent flow assumption, we've got F is 1.325. And we're taking the logarithm of k sub s divided by 3.7 times d plus 5.74 divided by the Reynolds number to the 0 0.9 power. And then we're squaring everything down there in the denominator. All right, so what we know is the diameter of the pipe, the relative roughness, the Reynolds number. So let me just plug everything in to this Jane equation, and we'll see how different is it from our fully turbulent flow. So it's the logarithm ln of 0 0.25 millimeters divided by 3.7 times 250 millimeters plus 5.74 divided by our Reynolds numbers 1.24 times 10 to the sixth. 1.24 times 10 to the 6th, and that's to the 0 0.9 power. Okay. So if we put all this into the Jane equation, then what it tells us is the uh, F value is 0 0.0199. And so our initial guess using fully turbulent was 0 0.196. And so... <laughs> Like, what's the percent difference? 0 0.0199 minus 0 0.0196 divided by 0 0.0199 uh, times 100. It's uh, about 1.8% difference. So that's close enough that we don't need to necessarily iterate a second time with this improved F value. We can if we've got some time to spare, but we won't. Not in this example. OK, does everybody understand the example? Here's another way we could have solved it. We could use Excel. And uh, the way that we could do it with Excel is we can have both the pump curve and the system curve and find out where do they overlap. So let's just have some variety of different flow rates and we're going to have the pump curve H sub P and that's going to have units of meters. And then we're going to have the system curve HP and that's in terms of meters. And then what we're looking for is where is the difference equal to zero. All right, so the, uh, the range of flow rates is starting at zero, and let's just do it in 0.05 meter increments until we get up to like 0.4. And that'll just allow us to see what's going on with both the pump curve and the system curve. So the uh, pump curve in the example, uh, 24.4 uh, minus 7.65 Q squared. All right, so pump curve is 24.4 minus 7.65 times Q squared. So this tells us the pump head as a function of different flow rates. And then the system curve um, we still had to develop that manually. The system curve that we came up with is 9.1 plus 249.74 Q squared. Okay, so equals 9.1 plus 
7, 4 times q squared. And then this is telling us, for a variety of flow rates, how much head loss is taking an effect. And then we'll take the difference between these two, because we know that the operating point is when the difference is 0. And so here we're pretty close. We can set up a goal seek, so data, make this a little bit bigger, data, what if analysis, goal seek. So our goal is for the difference to be 0 by changing the flow rate. And then numerically it goes and finds the point at which there's no difference between the uh, system curve and the pump curve. And so it's 0.244. And so we could graph this, you know, if we like. We could have a graph that's showing the same characteristic shapes that we've seen before. Uh, doesn't Excel always do such a nice job guessing what we want graphed? It really, they've, you know, the AI they've put into that's just jaw dropping. Uh, let's remove all this. All right, so we want on the uh, horizontal axis to be the flow rate, and the vertical will have the pump curve on one of them. All right, and then we'll add another series. So this is our, um, what did I do, pump curve first? Okay. And then we'll add another series that was going to be our system curve. And on the x-axis will be flow rate. And on the vertical axis will be the system curve. All right. And so this is kind of that same shape that we saw before, where we have the intersection point between the increasing amount of head that's required to achieve a flow rate going through the pipes, the decreasing amount of head that can be generated by this pump, and the operating point is the intersection between the two. So that's a variety of different ways that you can solve problems like this, the pump operation type problems. Um, here is one of those manufacturer provided uh, pump curves that gives you quite a lot of information. What this is showing is a certain pump that is capable of being rotated at different uh, RPMs. So they're showing you, first of all, this shape, you know, how it keeps getting lower as you increase the amount of flow rate. So that's the shape that we've seen before. And you can see they've got the pump curve for 3,600 RPMs, 3,200 RPMs. So the faster you drive it with a different motor, the pump can achieve a varying level of head performance. These curves, where it's saying 50, 55, 60, 63, and so on, these are the efficiencies. So you, if you happen to be spinning this pump at 3,200 RPM and you're achieving about 200 gallons per minute, then that would be right at about 55% efficient. So that means that you're having to put in a lot more electricity to the uh, motor than you're actually getting energy going into the system through the pressure that's added. So you can see that the best operating point for this particular pump, 65% efficiency, looks like it's about the highest. So this pump is meant to be operated in the 400 GPM range. That's ideal for that pump. 400 GPM and between 3200 and 3600 RPMs is going to give you the best performance from an economic standpoint. This last set of curves, these dashed lines, NPSH is what we're going to be talking about. And this is giving you an idea of the risk of cavitation inside of that pump. It stands for net positive suction head. Um, now, before we talk about net positive suction head, I wanted to give you a hint on kind of an unusual homework problem. They already tell you the system curve. So this is given directly, 30 plus 2q squared. So you don't even have to substitute in the... Uh, the pipe length, and you don't have to use the fully turbulent flow assumption to get your F value. They've just given you the system curve. But you have to do something a little bit unusual in order to find the pump curve. Here's the pump curve, and it's given in a graphical way. You need to come up with an equation for this curve. Now, at first glance, you may not know how you're going to turn this into an equation, but um, the form of the equation is always going to be 
H sub P is some y-intercept, and so the y-intercept is obviously 200. But then there's some coefficient that, where it's minus C times Q squared. So what you have to do is find out what C value gives you a curve that looks like this. And so my suggestion is digitize this curve. Make an Excel spreadsheet where you put in a bunch of known points between the Q and the HP. So for instance, we know that 0Q is 200. Uh, 20, if we went over, then 20 is 150. You could put in 10. A what flow rate gives you which head. So you just take a ruler in your book and a pencil and try and make straight lines for different flow rates and what's the head amount. And then using this form of the equation, you come up with a guess value of what the pump head would be. And then you're trying to minimize the difference between this known amount of pump head and your guess pump head based on C. So if C is 0.1, for example, then this column, you're going to use the flow rate that's known to come up with a guess H sub P. So you'd have 200 minus 0.1 times Q squared. And then you'd get whatever the calculated pump head is for that guess C value. So, so up here somewhere, you've got a C value. And so then you can do a goal seek or a solver where you're trying to come up with the smallest average difference between the known pump head and the guess value of the pump head based on changing C. So that's a hint that I'm giving you for problem 24. And it may take a while for you to figure out what I mean. But start by creating a table of digitizing this curve and trying to reproduce the equation that describes that curve. So what C value can you use to come up with a curve that looks like the one they give you from the, from the textbook? And then it's easy from there. Once you come up with the pump curve, you set it equal to the system curve and solve for Q. This is just another one of those interesting numerical methods that sometimes pops up in engineering, where you've got a figure but not an equation for it. So you can make your own equation. All right, so cavitation is uh, the last thing we're going to talk about today, the risk that little uh, vapor bubbles are going to form. And this is uh, an, a high-speed photography image that shows cavitation occurring with an impeller. Because um, when you have an impeller spinning through water, there's going to be a pressure side of the impeller and a suction side of the impeller. And the suction side, the pressure can get low enough that it causes the water to begin to go from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Anytime the pressure surrounding water drops below the vapor pressure, then it starts to boil. And we've talked about how water can boil either by increasing the temperature of the water so that the vapor pressure is really high, or by decreasing the uh, pressure that surrounds the water until it equals the vapor pressure. So we've talked about how the pressure is gradually getting lower and lower, and there's this risk that prior to the water going through the pump, it may go below the uh, vapor pressure in absolute terms. So the rule is, is if the absolute pressure on the suction side falls below vapor pressure, then the water will vaporize. And those little um, water vapor bubbles, when they get to the pressure side of the pump, they collapse and send a shock wave. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the little jets that can form when those bubbles collapse, the uh, localized velocity of the water can be 110 meters per second. And uh, that can cause an increase of pressure in the, the amount of about 800 megapascals. And that vastly exceeds the uh, strength of materials to resist it. Uh, the fact that these are really small vapor bubbles is the only reason why the uh, failure is usually gradual rather than sudden and catastrophic. So this is uh, an illustration of some impellers that have experienced damage due to a localized uh, low pressure, where along the edge of that impeller, the pressure is going low enough that the water begins to vaporize, and then it collapses, and the shock wave causes pitting on the metal. 
So this isn't corrosion due to salt or exposure to air or rust. This is uh, pitting due to cavitation. All right, so here's how you go through the calculations to find out how risky is it, you know, is there going to be cavitation in a pump? You start by calculating how much available net positive suction head there is. And uh, the available net positive suction head starts with atmospheric pressure. So this P naught divided by gamma is the, uh, is the starting point that all of these other factors are reduced against. Um, so you'll notice that how high the water is being lifted, the delta ZS is one of the terms. The head loss only in the suction side of the pump is one of the terms. And then the vapor pressure is the third term that re uh, can account for answering the question, how far is the system from cavitating? And so you calculate how much net positive suction head is available, and then a uh, pump manufacturer will tell you how much is required. So you can go through the calculations of finding available, and then if we go back to this curve that we saw previously, this is how a manufacturer would tell you how much is required. So remember we said that really good operating point was here in the range of about 400 GPM. So here what they're saying is you need 15 feet of net positive suction head, and if you have less than that, there's the risk of cavitation. So the manufacturer will tell you the requirement, and you calculate how much is available, and then the criteria that you apply is if the required amount is more than what's available, then cavitation occurs, and then you're at risk of having damage to the system. So uh, if it is equal to each other, we call that the point of incipient cavitation. That means it's just about to start. And this is kind of the critical point where if you're trying to design the maximum amount of water, uh, the maximum elevation of water can be lifted, then you set the two equal to each other. OK, so here, let's say that we are going to be pumping water from the lower reservoir to the upper one. And we know that uh, from the lower reservoir to the pump is 4.3 meters. And you measure the delta Z only on the suction side. So here for the available NPSH, you'll see it's delta Z S. And so you don't go all the way up to the upper reservoir. It's just from the lower reservoir to where the pump is located. And the same thing about these head losses. It's just the head losses between the lower reservoir and the pump. So you only have to account for the length of the pipe that's from the lower reservoir to the pump. You'd exclude everything that's happening after the pump. All right, so here what we know from the manufacturer is that this pump requires 3.5 meters of NPSH. And so what I'd like you to calculate is identify what is the NPSH available and compare how much is available to what's required and predict whether or not there's going to be cavitation. Do you remember what P naught is? What value to use for P naught? We have to use the absolute uh, pressure, absolute atmospheric pressure. So that's a 101325 for uh, the pressure of air at standard temperature, zero elevation, you know, sea level.
Okay, so it's not going to cavitate, right? Not under the certain uh, circumstances that are described here. So you start off with atmospheric, and then all these other factors just brings you closer and closer to cavitation. So like if the pipe was longer and there was more suction side head losses, that brings you closer to the risk of cavitation. Or what if the water was warmer? If we had warmer water, that would have increased the vapor pressure, and that brings you closer to cavitation. Or um, let's consider it this way. Our maximum for this is 3.5, right? The manufacturer says that you have uh, 3.5 required. And how much do we have available? 3.7. So how much higher could we have lifted this pump above the water surface before we see cavitation? Uh, looks like we could take it up maybe 0.26 meters. So if this was 5 meters above the water surface, then there would be cavitation. So that's one of the things you have to be careful about when you're using pumps and placing them into service is there is a limit to how high on the suction surface you can lift the water or how long the suction side length of the pipe is. Uh, and if you actually uh, see in the field, oftentimes it's pretty common to have a bigger diameter pipe for the suction side than it is on the discharge side because that's where you're the most worried about head loss is on the suction side because on the discharge side, I mean, you're losing energy due to head loss, but it's not going to cause damage to the pump in the same way that if you have a small diameter suction size pipe, side pipe, then it can contribute to cavitation. <coughs> okay, so any questions on this cavitation example? All right, so let's take one last look at these announcements before we finish. Okay, your homework assignment is due on Tuesday. We're having an exam on Tuesday. I've got lots of office hours between now and then, so please feel free to stop by if you have any questions on the homework or uh, need help getting ready for the test. Anyways, I will see you on Thursday.